significant songbirds. And I'm going to jump right into it. So we're kind of going to start big picture, talking about birds in general and their role in the ecosystem. And then we're going to talk about a few common songbird species that you might see in your yard or out and about. And then we're going to talk a little bit about songbird conservation and what you can do to help. So when we're talking about birds and their value and role in the ecosystem, we often talk about ecosystem services. And so just want to put a quick definition to that so we're all on the same page. Um, these are basically nature's benefits or the benefits that we get from nature. Um, and it's specifically related to humans. Obviously, trees provide um, benefits for wildlife. But when we're talking about ecosystem services, it's the values that we as people get from nature. And researchers work really hard to put a dollar value on these services so that we can compare apples to apples. Um, so like if a developer wants to um, knock down a parcel of land that's all natural, you know, there's no real good way to say, what's that really worth? So they're working on that by putting a price tag on these ecosystem services. So when we're talking about birds, um, in terms of the value of these ecosystem services, there's pretty limited research, but just in time for this webinar, I got this magazine from Cornell that talked about what research there is about the ecosystem services that birds provide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a few of those. So first we're starting off with their role as pollinators. And James talked about this in the first webinar for those of you that might've been there um, when he was talking about the buzz on Florida's pollinators. And so obviously for us here in Florida, probably the one we think about often is hummingbirds. Um, and the research shows the limited research that we have shows that between three to five percent um, of our of birds can serve as pollinators for about 1500 different plant species um, and three quarters of those cannot be self cannot self pollinate so they need these pollinators in order to thrive um, and there's also concern that they might or at least concern that there's not enough research to show their value in the winter time when insects and what we often think of pollinators are doing their role um, or they'd be less active in the winter and that birds might be providing more of a role as pollinators during that time. So there's also the ecosystem service of spreading seeds. I don't think I need to explain that too much more. Um, sometimes they can fall out or right everything that eat, eats poops. We learned that in elementary school. Um, oops. And so um, there was a really cool study done in Sweden looking at the value of Eurasian jays and how much it would cost if we were to do that same service of planting seeds that they do just by going about their daily business. And they put a value on it that it would cost anywhere between $2,500 to $11,000 per bird for that service that they do. So super awesome for spreading seeds. Um, pest control is another service that birds provide um, that we often don't hear too much about. We often think of things like ladybugs or mantids in our garden as natural pest control, but birds do a great job of this as well. Um, so there's two, there's a lot of studies on this. Um, two that I'm going to highlight. One was done in a Dutch apple plantation, um, and they compared a control where they kind of kept the birds out of the plantation, one where they allowed the birds to be, and there was a 66% 66, 66 increase in yields of apples where the birds were present and able to control the pests that would otherwise destroy the apple crop. And for the coffee lovers out there, um, there was another study done on J a Jamaican coffee plantation. There's a pest beetle that was really impacting um, the coffee berries. And so they did a similar study, keeping the birds out, allowing the birds to be there. And they were not only to, able to show an increase in yields of the coffee berries, but also went on to show the increase in income for the farmers. Now this one, I actually heard them talking about this on NPR the other day, um, related to vultures and their service as our custodians. Um, There's a study done in India that was looking at vultures. They were seeing a decline in the vulture population and they were, weren't really sure why they were declining and found out that when they were feeding on cattle that had passed away, 
that had been given anti-inflammatory drugs. These were killing the vultures. Those drugs had a negative impact to the vultures. So the vulture population was going down dramatically. Um, wild dogs and rats started moving in to fill that niche of cleaning up these dead animals, which led to a dramatic increase in pathogens. Um, things like rabies and just other diseases, and they equated it, there was 48,000 um, human-related rabies deaths, as well as um, a cost to India's economy of $34 billion over a 14-year period when um, the vultures were basically completely gone. So we love our vultures. Different species in India, but same concept and idea. And then, of course, the aesthetics. We love, hopefully, <laughs> to get to see these beautiful birds. Um, you know, the economic driver of bird watching in Florida is also huge and it impacts culture and arts and music. So lots of benefits um, from these birds. So thank you to our birds. Okay, so now we're gonna jump in. Again, that was kind of the big picture. Now we're gonna talk about songbirds specifically. So these are the five species that we are going to discuss um, in the order that you see on your screen. And I'm going to talk about some identification. I'm going to play a common song of these species and then talk about their diet and how you might be able to help provide um, some of the things that they feed on. But before I do that, we're going to do a quick poll question. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen. Just curious how many um, bird species do you think there are or have been documented in Florida? This does include exotic species as well, though that's not going to dramatically increase, impact the number. Okay, most people, give me a couple more seconds. Okay, and I will share these with everybody. So actually the majority of you got it correct. It is 500, so, um, oops, let me close that out. I hope that closed on your screen. Shannon, I guess you can tell me otherwise. I might have done that wrong. Um, so yeah, 500 species, it's a lot. Um, so we're gonna start small and start with a few. And that is um, always a good way to start so you don't get overwhelmed. So first up is the Northern Cardinal. This is probably one that most of you know and are familiar with, um, at least the male, the bright red male, uh, very easy to identify, um, brilliant, brilliant red. They have kind of this dark mask around their face and a very um, thick bright orange bill as well. What's unique about the cardinals is that the males look different from the females. So you can see the female is on the right in the picture where they're together and on the top on your right hand side. So the females are kind of a light brown color but they do have hints of red in their wings um, as well as their tail. And I mentioned that they have a prominent crest on the top of their head. It's not always up, but when it is in the female, there's also, it's kind of like tipped with red. So there is red also um, in the females. And the cool thing with cardinals is when you see one fly by, male or female, if you probably count to three, it, you'll probably see their partner nearby. They are often found in pairs. So always fun to watch um, when they are out and about. So I'm gonna play a common call for the cardinal. We often say, we call this call the laser beam call. Um, and they also, we say that it sounds like they're saying, birdie, 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 birdie. You'll hear it. I'm not very good at it, but here we go. <laughs> so hopefully you are able to hear that um, and you can see probably where I get the laser beam idea from. Um, again, cardinals have lots of calls as do most songbirds, but that is one of the um, more common ones. 
So in terms of their diet, their beaks or bills are designed for eating seeds and fruit, um, but they will also feed on insects. So um, you can see some of their favorites there, dogwood. We don't necessarily have flowering dogwood in this part of the state, but we do have swamp dogwood, um, wild grape, blackberry, sumac, and grass seeds they love. Um, and they'll feed on a wide variety of insects, um, which you can see there. So I have pictured at the bottom is a katydid and a click beetle. So some potential prey items for the northern cardinal. So next up is the northern mockingbird, um, which gets their name because they can mock lots of calls. Um, so they have many, many, many calls that they can make. So that's not necessarily one that you can be like, oh, I hear it and know that that's a mockingbird. Um, but if you do get to see them, they're one of the um, larger songbirds that we're gonna talk about today. So it's more of a medium-sized songbird. Relatively small head compared to its body and also longer legs. They do have, I believe, where's my mouse? There it is. Um, these two white wing bars, it's not super noticeable on this particular image. Um, some are more distinct than others, but wing bars are an, a helpful identifier when talking about identifying any bird species. So um, the two white wing bars are helpful for identification with the mockingbird. Um, they're just generally a, a kind of light gray on top and then almost white to a super pale gray on the underside. So I'm gonna just play one of their calls. Um, again, it might not be super helpful, but it's always fun. So you can see right there, they already went through like three different calls. Um, so it can kind of be all over the place. Uh, they do tend to be kind of quick like that, but again, they can mimic lots of different calls. So um, in terms of mockingbirds diet, so they mostly feed on insects in the summertime when they're abundant and then we'll switch over to fruit uh, the rest of the year. So again, a wide variety of insects, um, beetles, earthworms, moths, um, grasshoppers. They are also known to eat small lizards. So don't be surprised if you see that. And again, wide variety of berries featured here on the right is um, one of our native blueberry species. And on the left is um, a rosy maple moth caterpillar. And I'm going to throw another poll question at you. OK, so this one is multiple, multiple choice in that we want you to check all that apply to this question. Um, so which of the following bird species can benefit from an artificial nest box? And you'll know why I'm asking this question once we're done. <laughs> I'll give you a little bit more time since there's more than one correct answer. Okay, mm, give you two more seconds. I like Shannon's two second rule. <laughs> okay, we're gonna end polling. I'm gonna share the results. So you guys actually got, the majority got the three of them. So it is the Carolina Wren, the Tufted Titmouse, and the Carolina Chickadee, which are gonna be the next three species that we talk about. So the Carolina Wren, super cute. There was actually one just outside of my office, so I got slightly distracted. Um, it's a really small, stout bird. I always think about like cupping my hands and I feel like he would just fit perfectly in there. Beautiful chestnut brown on top, um, lighter brown on the underside. They have a really long, slender curved bill, which you can see really well in this photo. And they do often have their tail perked up, which can be helpful for identification. Um, sometimes they'll be jumping around all the time and it kind of flicks up and down and up and down. Um, and they have a really distinct white eyebrow. Um, so 
one thing about wrens that we often say is you would imagine there's a giant bird <laughs> when you hear them call. They're like the smallest bird with the loudest voice. Um, so I'm gonna give you a taste of what they sound like. Again, many calls, but this um, is a common one and people often say it sounds like they're saying tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. Obviously a lot faster than I can say tea kettle, but you get the idea. Um, so that's one of the common calls for the Carolina wren. Often um, with birds, we can, if we get good at it, um, you're not always able to hear, or I'm sorry, see the bird, but if you can hear the call and know what the bird is, it's still equally as fun. You can kind of go bird watching by listening. Bird hearing. Okay, so for Carolina wren, that long slender bill is really designed for getting at insects. Um, so that's their main go-to. Um, they'll feed on plants occasionally, but much prefer insects. Uh, tend to love hanging out in urban areas where the spider webs are all in the corners. Um, so you often find them nesting kind of in the eaves um, around buildings. But they will also use a cavity or a, a nest box if provided. So spiders, caterpillars, beetles, again, the whole nine yards, I would say spiders are what I often see them eating the most. Um, and in terms of the fruit, they these were some that were listed um, from the research that I did. I'm not sure how particularly picky, picky they are, but um, wax myrtle, sweet gum, and poison ivy. So I have the poison ivy and its berries uh, shown on the screen there. And then if you can make out the cricket on the left, um, there is a cricket there down in the leaf litter. Obviously with poison ivy, you know, if you have it in your yard and it's away from people, then you could consider leaving it for the wrens. So tufted titmouse, I put a smiley face on here because anything with big eyeballs to me is super cute. So um, in terms of their head size, unlike the mockingbird, they have a relatively large head compared to their body size. Um, they have this gray crest, so a crest similar to the a cardinal, and they also, similar to the cardinal, have a black mask, though theirs is just more like a little patch above their bill. Um, and they're always this kind of darker gray on top, have this rusty patch here, and are kind of this white, um, off-white color on the underside. So the tufted tip mouse is often um, their call is said to say, Peter, 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 Peter. So let's hear their call. So that one's a little bit easier. I, I feel like I can often put those two together, Peter, 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 and then you just have to remember what bird that's associated with, which can be challenging, but Again, starting small. So the tufted titmouse will um, feed on both, again, insects and fruit. Um, again, insects more so in the summertime when they're more abundant. Wide variety, um, they'll even eat things like wasps, stink bugs. Um, they really like tree hoppers or leaf hoppers. So I have a picture of a leaf hopper on here. Some harvester ants, a little beetle, um, and this is I wish I could um, quiz you guys on everything, but um, this is one of our garden orb weavers. I wasn't able to find any specific fruits that they feed on, but um, other than acorns and beech nuts from the beech tree, but that's really only found in North Florida. So if anyone's joining us from North Florida and you have a beech tree in your yard, you could consider um, keeping it or planting more uh, to support the tufted titmouse. So I'm just checking on time. Okay, so last up for the common uh, songbird species is the Carolina chickadee. So this is one that is often referred to as the black-capped chickadee because, well, it has a black cap, so that makes sense, and that's a species that exists. Um, the thing is, black-capped ch chickadees are only found in the northern part of the United States. So if you see a bird that looks like this, 
you can be guaranteed that it's a Carolina chickadee. Um, the black-capped chickadee's migration route, nothing even comes this far south. So just make sure you're calling it the correct name. Uh, black cap on the head, they kind of have this white patch on their cheek and a black bib or neck, however you want to refer to that part of the bird. Um, they have this long skinny tail, super cute bird in my personal opinion. And they have a really distinct and unique call. I couldn't really come up with like a saying for this one. Um, so, but it does kind of go high, low, high, low. So that's a pretty fun one um, if you hear that and you can say that's a Carolina chickadee and then you can go looking for it. They're super fun. Sometimes they'll hang upside down while they're trying to feed. Um, the tufted titmouse will also do that too. So I wanted to switch it up instead of uh, saying fruit and insects. I went with plants and animals for this one. Um, so they'll eat both but um, more so are feeding on um, insects and spiders. So uh, their preference, again, is mostly for spiders, but they'll also, I've seen them eating caterpillars quite a bit, um, beetles, and they'll even eat aphids, um, for those of you that garden. And then, again, a wide variety of seeds and berries and small fruit. So here, this would be a double whammy for them, right? They get a spider and a beetle. <laughs> um, then caterpillars, and this is one of our um, huckleberry species on the bottom right. And the reason I'm going over the diet for each of these is to think about um, planting some of these things in your yard or providing habitat for things like spiders and insects in your yard to provide a food source for these species. Um, I'm going to just touch on a few other species. You know, I could go on forever and ever. It was really hard to narrow it down for the time frame we have here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So these are some other common songbirds species that we'll see. The top row are only seasonally, so in the winter time, uh, these are some of our winter migrants. The catbird, I'm just going to play their call real quick, get their name because their call sounds like this. <coughs> Which people often think sounds like a cat meowing, so um, very distinct bird. Uh, gray, kind of a dark gray. They have a darker um, patch on the top of their head and kind of this little rust patch which you can kind of make out in this photo here. Uh, hermit thrush is another one. They are very well known for their beautiful songs, but when they're down here in the winter, they're not breeding, um, so they're not really calling, unfortunately. But you can listen to their calls online, and I'll send out some links after for all of that. Yellow rumped warbler is another species. We call this one the butter butt. Don't say that to anybody else, but <laughs> he's got this little um, bright yellow patch um, on its rump, hence the name, um, which is really helpful for identification. So if you catch a glimpse of that, it's um, often helpful um, to narrow that down. White eyed vireo is another one. They are here uh, year round. They have guess what? A white eye, which you can kind of make out here in this photo compared to the dark eyes um, of the other species. Pretty distinct bird here. They have those wing bars, like I mentioned with the mockingbird. And then another common one is the blue-gray gnatcatcher, which is super cute, very small. I often will be like, hummingbird. No, it's a blue-gray gnatcatcher. Uh, they get their name from the blue-gray color that they have. Um, and these don't sit still very long at all. They're always hopping all over the place. And often when they call, it's this super quiet whisper. And it sounds like what you would imagine a bird talking to itself, like on and on. And it's super, super cute. Um, I don't have time to play all the calls today, but you can play around with that when I send the links out. So before I move on, um, I'm going to do another poll question. Okay, so I talked earlier about, earlier about the ecosystem services that birds provide. Um, oh, sorry, my computer screen randomly 
blanks out. Okay, so some birds can eat as many as blank insects a day during the summer months. Is it five or 50, 100, 200, or 300? Okay. Two second rule. <laughs> okay. Share result. Man, you guys are good. I don't even need to give this webinar. <laughs> yes, 300 is the correct answer. So the majority of you got that correct. Obviously, it's going to vary, um, and insects are more abundant in the summer months, but pretty cool service that they provide. So good job on that. So this is another kind of fun little break we're gonna take, um, at least from thinking and have you use your vision. I want you to raise your hand when you can spot the bird in this photo. Look, oh, getting there. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you guys can see. I can see how many people are raising their hand. We're at 18 right now, if that is helpful to any of you out there <laughs> that might be struggling. And there's 50 plus people on the webinar, so. All right. I'm gonna, oh, it keeps going up. I'm gonna do the two second rule just for the sake of time. Okay, so about half of you were able or claim, maybe you're not looking at the wrong thing, to see this bird. So it's actually right dead in the middle of your screen. So this is the hermit thrush that I th showed you on the previous slide. So you can see very well camouflaged bird. Um, they do this super cute, kind of flickering of their leg against the leaf litter to scare out insects and then they'll run over and grab them. It's really entertaining to watch. But um, anyway, so just wanted to play that fun little game. This was taken right outside my office. Okay, had to share that fun fact. Okay, wrapping up here, um, just talking about some bird conservation. So biggest threats. Uh, loss of habitat, we talk about that pretty much with any wildlife species. So to kind of help alleviate that issue, you can consider for our cavity nesters leaving old snags, so standing dead trees in your yard, um, or adding artificial habitat if you don't have the option to have a snag in your yard. You could also, if you have any like large branches that have fallen or anything, you could leave them in your yard to rot, which and decompose, um, which often invite insects, which is again, a great food source, and planting native plants to provide all those fruits that they love. So pets, you know, especially cats, we've probably heard about their impact on native bird populations. So cats should be kept indoors. They're not native to the area. Um, if you, there's something called a catio, but basically keeping them out on the patio if they need to go, you know, quote unquote, outside. Um, Collisions is a big one, whether it's with vehicles or buildings, but the number one is with glass buildings or windows. Um, I'm gonna send out a link if you have this issue at work or at home, and it's got a ton of different options of things that you can try. And accidental poisoning. Shannon talked about this with her owl webinar. So similar here with songbirds, you know, if you're applying pesticides in your yard and the birds eat those pests that you're targeting, it could also impact and kill the birds. So trying to limit or uh, not use pesticides at all. And again, consider adding artificial habitat, just highlighting here again, the three common species that we have that you might be more likely to attract to um, a nest box if you build it for the Carolina Wren, Chickadee, and Tufted Titmouse. And it, I'll be sending out um, plans for those boxes as well. And like I men mentioned, there's you know over 500 species of birds that have been documented. This is just a good starting point. There's tons of uh, smartphone apps out there that can help you. I listed some of the free ones here. There are also many more that you can purchase 
to help you. So whichever one, you know, everyone kind of learns differently. So you can download some of the free ones and mess around. And uh, this one here is the from the Cornell lab, which is one probably all extension agents go to Cornell for any bird information. So uh, recommend this one for sure. But you can check them all out. I'll send the link with the full list, including the ones that you can pay for uh, following the webinar. And kind of just quick summary, right? It's okay to be a bird nerd. It's the cool thing with bird watching is that birds are everywhere and anywhere that you go. So it's a hobby that you can do uh, no matter what, all the time, any day, anywhere. And birds are really important in ways that we might often not often think about. So economically, environmentally, and socially important to us. And there's tons of ways you can help, many of which I had just highlighted, planting native plants, putting up a nest, nest box, um, keeping your cat indoors, so on and so forth. You know, any way you can provide habitat or a food source for these birds will be helpful. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Looks